The Tesla stock is down, Elon Musk fighting against the woke mind virus and triggering the political left. He counts bots to negotiate a new Twitter deal, all while FSD is improving and a better expansion is on the horizon. So a lot of stirring around Tesla again, like we are used to, but all of this doesn't change the fundamentals of the company. That's why I've invited the agility specialist and scrum master Joe Justice to the rescue. And that's why today we are talking about the agility of Tesla. So Joe, how about you tell us a little bit about you and your background a little bit. What, what, what? Welcome to Tesla <laughs> Fair. It's Joe Justice from Honolulu, Hawaii. Very excited to be talking to Jan, not so far from Giga Bradenburg, Giga Berlin. The folks doing the good work to improve the world. It's my honor and privilege to be here. I worked with Bill Gates, then the leadership team at Amazon, and then ultimately operated Agile at Tesla for Elon Musk. I'm happy to talk about anything that I understand <laughs> yeah. well enough to the point that maybe I can communicate it. Yeah, that's great. Let's just jump right in uh, with the first question. You're a scrum master. You wrote a book about that and you're, you're focused on agility very much. Maybe you can tell us a little bit about your work at Tesla especially and how you would uh, say that you perceived the company culture there and, and what was your feeling um, with your experience? Tesla doesn't even use the word agility. They're so far beyond what most companies mean. They, they can't find a word that means what they want. Instead, what, what means this idea, the expression that they're using is pace of innovation is the only thing that matters in the long run. And what most of us understand as agility, the idea of taking a, a year long budget or longer and shortening it into a sequence of 30 day or shorter budgets mm -hmm. called a product backlog, that fits because that increases the pace of innovation. What we think we know about small, co-located, collaborative, self-organizing, self-managing teams, that fits because it increases the pace of innovation. Tesla doesn't use a system called Scrum that's um, mm -hmm. moving towards Agile from year-long budgets or what we would call waterfall. Tesla doesn't use something called the scaled, scaled Agile framework, which also moves from year-long budgets to quarterly budgets and organizing trains to uh, make clear and minimize dependencies across groups. Instead, Tesla is the quickest structure I've ever experienced ever on planet Earth. And most of that is enabled by Tesla AI what a lot of us would call Tesla Vision, Tesla AI, Tesla Auto Labeler, Tesla Auto, Auto Bidder, and digital self-management to make nearly 100% of the workforce directly able to be engineering hands-on, which is what makes pace of innovation rise. And if that's the only thing that matters in the long run, you definitely don't want an engineer waiting for a senior engineering approval review. Yeah, that, that's crazy um, how it's implemented. It's very interesting for me with my background in the design space. I know design thinking, ideation methods and everything and um, looking at that very closely. And it's so interesting to see that Tesla is such an outlier even there. Do you think it's it's because this innovation topic is so strongly implemented into the culture? Because uh, we also saw the leak of the anti-handbook handbook that uh, Tesla published. And I was talking with Fazat about that, that they are priming their workers for that. So they are so primed to focus on, on innovation first. So do you think they don't really need Scrum because or, or something like that? Because it's so implemented into their DNA almost. Yeah, Scrum is by definition, I, I don't know how many people even know. Scrum is a set of 11 rules mm -hmm. to help a company go from annual budgets and year-long projects to projects and budgets that are less than 30 days. That's what Scrum is mm -hmm. for. Uh, and it's 11 rules to do that. It's based on teams. It has roles, events, and those 11 rules. Uh, that is what Scrum is awesome for doing. If your company currently takes more than a year to decide to do something, release the budget to do something, allocate the budget to do something, and then have it done, tested, released in the field, generating the value it's supposed to generate. If that currently takes a year or longer, Scrum is going to help you a lot. What Scrum doesn't do well is once you're less than 30 days from deciding to do something with a budget to executing, already it starts to become too much overhead, especially as you reach less than two weeks. It is possible to do one week sprints in Scrum where you have a budget allocation meeting and product planning meeting called 
uh, called sprint planning. And then you have daily checkups of the trend. Already it's becoming cumbersome. It is nearly impossible to use the 11 rules of Scrum effectively to the way that you're not just doing it to say you did, but to actually add value in less than a day. And when Tesla is making 60 part changes a day in production while removing 61 or more parts, the total part number continues to go down. That's right? crazy. Yeah. So they're retiring even more. That's, it's harder to retire a part than to design a new one. And mm. there's 60 new parts introduced a day. There's 61 or more parts retired a day, which is actually even harder to do. There's no room for these frameworks. So how did that happen? For most companies who are aspire to this, you want to train everyone in a new mindset and, and hopefully the largest groups of people simultaneously as possible so you can have reinforcement and reminding of each other. Mm -hmm. And then you do have coaches. These are called agile coaches. You may have met one, you may, have, you may be one. <laughs> And your job is to remind and build habits around these practices. Mm -hmm. If you already have cultural inertia, if the majority of employees are already behaving in this fast innovation way or a faster innovation way than what you can train, mm -hmm. right? there's no value to training and there's no value to coaching. And that's what Tesla does. You're primed by the anti-handbook handbook and then you go directly into work and there's over a hundred thousand employees now already behaving that way there is no value or need for follow-on training or coaching instead it's hardcore execution i wrote a day in the life of a scrum master and i had to split it into three sections it's, it's one page but it's a page split into three sections the first is a day in the life of a scrum master or an agile coach or an agile champion at a company that has year long or longer new product introduction cycles and budgets. And, and that's fairly clear what you would need to do. That's fairly well understood. Then a day in the life of a company that's at 30 day budgets. So you've reached the value Scrum is supposed to give you. You've hit that. And that's already a huge challenge to most companies. So congratulations. And so what are you doing when you're doing? You're, you've transcended the framework. And then what did I actually do all day at Tesla? And man, it, it reads like the description of a battle. It's, it's, it's just so absurd. So, so awesome from an innovation context or, or, or like the, the daily training of a pro athlete where you're trying yeah. to burst apart muscle fibers as fast and completely as possible. It's, it's like that. <laughs> Yeah, that's crazy. That's something I, I haven't figured out right now uh, as much because I've talked about that before that uh, also that the burnout rate in the company is also uh, like they eat through their workers some, some time and they had to have to take some time off. Not not everybody, but, but many people are really uh, having sometimes a hard time to keep up. What I've heard is the pressure isn't from outside, the pressure is from the inside because the workers are so... Um, Yeah, because they believe in the mission. And I've compared two episodes before uh, the mission statements of different companies like VW, Porsche, uh, Audi, and I've compared them Mercedes, for example. You see that the mission statement doesn't really affect your inner core. And that's the difference between the mission statement of Tesla, which is accelerating the world to sustainable energy, which is really a, a mission to follow through. And in that work culture, you work so hard, you, you work your over hours, uh, you don't really care. And people, yeah, then burn out a little bit and just have to take a few days off. In your coaching experience, how did you observe that? Is, is that also a factor that is um, problematic or is, is that good? Or how do you think about that? There's two important and valuable ways for Tesla fix to help everyone understand this situation. And one is the burnout rates a lot lower than it was. So what helped mm -hmm. because pace of innovation went up. So without reducing, in fact, with increasing pace of innovation, the burnout rate was reduced. So that's, that's one, what happened there? That's a useful story that Tesla fix can help the world understand. The second is, what is likely the more to do, because it could always get better and a lot better. There still is burnout. 
So what would improve it even more? So I'd like to ask you, Jan, which would you want to confront first? What's worked so far to improve it over, I mean, there were really tough days before, or what's the future? What is likely Tesla and other companies trying to achieve this rate of innovation to, uh, to, to make it sustainable, lovely, fun, and the lifestyle that you desire? Uh, I would say, like, look at the past a little bit because um, then you can determine what changed, what helped, and it is proven that it helped. So then you can uh, guess the next steps more, I think. Uh, we, we could dive into that first, yeah. Awesome, awesome. Okay, one is Tesla switched from 14-hour days to 12-hour days, and many people would still choose to do 14 or longer. That's okay. But the expected commitment was half, half a 24-hour cycle. People found a rhythm with that. Then the work week went to three days on, four days off, then four days on, three days off. Again, that made a rhythm. Now, many people choose to work all seven days. Mm -hmm. but they have this rhythm that they can fall back on whenever yeah. they get sick or their spouse gets sick or their kids need extra care or their neighbor sues them for having a tree too tall in their view and they've got to deal with whatever that means. I mean, oh, that reminds that me is. of Germany. <laughs> When life happens, you can fall back on a schedule that lets you engage with life in a more, more suitable way. Then way more impactful than that, many of the high stress waiting for feedback decisions so you could improve yourself and pat yourself on the back were automated by Tesla AI. And that is what has become digital self-management. In Tesla beginning, they didn't have that yet. And then the stacks developed over time, now to the point where you have very quick feedback on many, many different types of decisions, almost in some ways all, in some ways. And that makes it incredibly fun. You're not waiting for weeks or months To, I mean, you even see these cars being built and you're like, in three months, are we going to realize there's X problem and we have to re reclaim all of these cars we already sold, right? The AI is thorough enough that your confidence with your own decision is extremely high very quickly. And that, re that removes an enormous source of worry. Then Musk parties a lot harder now than Musk used to. Musk works even harder now. The Musk used to, as far as I can discern, not like I'm the magic Musk viewer, but it looks that way. The parties are way bigger. They're way more limbically resonant. Uh, so when you look at the opening of Giga Berlin versus the opening of SpaceX Hawthorne, uh, it's a dramatic evolution in what's possible. And then a short time later, You look at the opening of Cyber Rodeo, Giga Texas, I will posit it was even more phenomenal, if that's even possible, than Giga Bradenburg, Giga Berlin. And I assume that trend is only going to ramp up. Um, the coffee, and it's not just about caffeine, but the, the quality of life of really good coffee is readily available, made by baristas and baristos, or I think now we can use the gender neutral barista. Uh, live in every Tesla facility and it's free and it's unlimited and it's awesome. And there you can pick the bean, the grind, the roast, the, how you want it prepared. More and more quality of life attributes continue to be prioritized. Mm -hmm. And to the point where more and more of your time is spent directly innovating and less of it is on worrying, coping, etc. I've heard the bathrooms are way better Than when I was working in the company, even just a, two short years ago, um, and and that's a the, the bathrooms really were a challenge. They, they were clean. They, they were they met standard. They were really a challenge. Um, phenomenal improvements, I hear. So one by one, knocking out frustrations seems to be what has uh, what what has improved that situation. And I'd like to stress this for those who are in a position to influence a company, maybe their own company, maybe they're in a company. This is hard sweat work, really. Like knocking out frustrations 
is mostly difficult stuff you don't want to deal with. But when you do, it is worth it. But also, it never ends. They come back. The problems are there because something makes those problems happen. So you, you have to do it again. Mm -hmm. You have to do it again. And it never ends. But if you prioritize reducing friction from innovation, you get innovation. Yeah, that's very interesting because of the design background again. Uh, I totally understand why quality of life improvements are very important. So that's why I also focus on culture so, as much because it is the driving factor from my perspective, from my analysis that I've done over the years. And I mean, uh, designers want to nudge behavior all the time and we want to nudge people into into doing uh, something, but not in a controlling manner, like sometimes <laughs> in some campaigns, maybe a little bit more uh, uh, hypnosis or something. But but no, uh, nonetheless, uh, I'm focused on that. So so I really get your point why it's so important, um, especially uh, when you when you analyze behavior of people and 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 how how are they uh, moving inside of the company, how are they feeling, um, what's important to them, and like you said, m more things, more problems can arise out of that. You it's always you have always to evolve that, and and things change also, perspectives changes, and you have to test many things. <laughs> You have to test many things to find out what is the right thing to do. It's very interesting to see and hear that, or like you, you like you told us now, that they are improving that also because that was one of my main concerns also for uh, the opening of Giga Brandenburg because I know the German culture is definitely different than the American culture, especially the failure culture. I've touched on that with uh, Alex uh, Voigt um, last week. And yeah, it's very interesting to see that also that you have to adapt and hearing that is like very joyful for me because I'm like, oh, okay, good. Uh, that That's good that they focus on that and that they see that this is a huge factor for innovation also. Uh, for me, it's like uh, t Tesla is ramping up like crazy because of the opening of uh, Giga Texas especially and, and Brandenburg also scaling up. And then you have to ask yourself, what is after scaling up? That's very important. Quality control, for, for example, because Tesla had quality control issues before. And the Germans are good in quality control. You could say that because they're so perfectionistic, but they're not as agile. But that's something Tesla can teach them, which I'm very excited about because we need this culture change in Germany desperately. Because if you see um, all the things happening with German auto and what they are saying, It scares me a little bit uh, because uh, so many companies are uh, reliant on the big uh, German car brands because we have so many hidden, small hidden champions all around Germany that work for the German automotive industry. So really a huge deal here. But to get back to your point, yeah, great that <laughs> to hear that Tesla is improving uh, in that area. But uh, another question was before we move on to the German thing, things in German perspective, because that's what, what interests me also the most, uh, because I'm located here and I want to give a unique German perspective on Tesla. But how about you tell us a little bit more about the AI stuff? Because, I mean, it's crazy. These AI processes, especially the AI controlled line management system is so very interesting because management is really a pain some sometimes also micromanaging people and stuff like that is a huge factor of stifling innovation so maybe you can uh, t tell us something about the processes there sure sure most of us have in our mind when we think about um income and a company we've been i mean not not as tiny little kids but most of the scholastic systems globally And most of what we would learn if we were taught business, you know, if you actually went to get a master's of business administration degree or a doctorate in business or that type of thing, you're taught basically the fiefdom model, kings, queens, and castles. You're, you're, you're taught you centralize decision-making authority, you centralize wealth, and your job is to make decisions over allocation of wealth so that the people with, that don't have wealth have work allocated to them to provide resources that compounds, compounds the engine. Um, and this is ethically toxic if you're interested in equitable treatment of humans to, to start with. Like, like just on the face of it, it's absurd and disgusting. Then <laughs> you say, but what choice do I have? 
I made this company. I wanted to make life multiplanetary. I wanted to accelerate the advent of sustainable transportation. So of course I should be dictating budget and have a workforce that works for me. And you get this entitlement system and that, that's what fights back and perpetuates it. Well, I went through all this schooling and I went through all this experience and then I put my money down. So of course I'm entitled now. The entitled thinking which births classism and the problems associated with that often ultimately riots and lynching. So what's the alternative? If you, if you look at a, 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 a Shiba Inu, if you look at a Doge and you, you wanna teach it a, a, a trick, something, you, you have a desired behavior from the Shiba Inu, you can click, you can do a, a click when the Shiba Inu does the desired mm -hmm. behavior. And the Shiba Inu doesn't necessarily love the click, but it likes to play with you. Life is kind of a game most of the time. And it says, okay, well, I, I see I got a reaction when you did this. Well, if you give a human uh, an app, like most games don't come with a book to teach you how to play the game anymore. And instead the game teaches you how to play it by having a score go up or, or some don't even have a score, they have a sound or, or like streams of star emojis come off some area of the screen. And that's enough. You go, okay, the game just mm -hmm. clicked. It, it just gave me feedback. Yeah. Humans, dogs, most animals, arguably, depending on how we measure nutrient transfer from fungi to root systems, maybe trees and fungi as well, dig this type of feedback. So what if you put an AI learning algorithm around providing immediately visible sensory perceived feedback to humans as many as possible and simply tied that to a thousand year mission that's not going to run out anytime soon. The Musk companies have been building a stack to do that for decades now, well, almost two decades now. And by now, it actually solves a lot of situations by appealing to biological intrinsic motivation, simply saying, I would like to do a good job. Can I very quickly know, am I doing a good job in real time? The cool thing about physics is humans as a sensory organism primarily have our eyes, ears, nose, umami sensors, and, and those kinds of things, all of which can be modeled with sine waves and photon count. Sound, sound waves, even olfactory sensors can be sine waves on an olfactory, olfactory sensor suite. Um, touch, same, sine waves on pressure and vibration, electrical sensors, et cetera, even pheromones. The whole thing can be modeled by waveforms with photon count, photons and what's their waveform. Well, what is Tesla Vision really good at doing now? Looking at high definition video, multiple channels at once and labeling it. Well, that means any human sensory input, including smell, Tesla Vision can look at the waveform of it, the photon count and label it. And the labeling's actually really good now. What am I seeing? That's huge. So now you have a clean data set, which is the struggle of most machine learning. Tesla Vision has, I, it's never gonna end and it keeps getting better, but it's already good. There's already a massive data set all over these factories, more than 100,000 employees and more than 500,000 indirect employees worth of production data. What makes production, innovation, problem solving seem to work well. Then you have 2 million cars worth of usage data. You have hundreds of rocket launches, almost one a week now, of rocket data and deployment data. You have all the contracts signed auto bidder what makes global markets work you have dogecoin up and down what makes what affects those markets this is all now fairly clean data now you even have twitter so you have how do bots and humans engage like this is the the neuralink training ground right yeah, here it's mm -hmm. <laughs> you start training machine learning stacks and they're nowhere near, in, in my experience, in my understanding, AGI. What they're super good at doing is a particular weight state, removing the weight state. So I just adjusted the nozzle on these robots to apply this level of paint coating. And the ovens are ramping at a different 
ramp than we did before. The supplier of the paints are different today because we're coping with supply chain issues. The shape of this painted surface is now different and a different alloy for these reasons. You have a number of variables that would not be allowed in traditional manufacturing. You would wait two years to recertify your paint process, maybe five years or seven years, to recertify your paint process with one of those changes, much less all of those in a day. I have to, I have to, I have to stop you one second there. What I've heard from Sandy Monroe, what, what he said one time is they changed like a huge thing in three hours. Uh, that's what I've heard. Uh, not even days, uh, like some three days to three hours. It's all in that. It's so crazy. And VW has 30 hours to, to produce a car in, in comparison to a 10 hour uh, Model 3 production. Uh, yeah, that, uh, go on, please. I, I just wanted to add that. Well, well, let's be clear about how awesome Volkswagen is and how, and how many dramatic innovations Volkswagen to name just one, has brought to bear. I mean, Saab also, uh, formerly in Sweden, now Chinese-owned, um, BMW, um, Smart, now Daimler-owned, um, uh, the British companies, many of which are now Chinese-owned. But in any case, the innovations these stories brands have brought to the table and now continue to bring to the table. The difference here is there's an opportunity to make it much, much faster that some of these brands are going to do. Um, I don't know how soon, um, so I'm still long on Tesla, but I'm cheering for these brands. What no one wants is mass unemployment in VW and throughout VW supply chain. That's not the winning scenario. <laughs> that, is, that is a bad future. Um, these brands are awesome. Maybe not even these brands. These people are yeah. awesome. Uh, so let's help unblock them. Mm -hmm. And that's what digital self-management, Tesla AI It, it, it does do well. It says, well, I can analyze paint quality better than a lifetime pro mm -hmm. uh, a craft person mm -hmm. can. And that lifetime pro craftsperson to fully analyze all the coatings on a car completely is about a day. You hold a mirror, you're attempting to detect individual wavelengths of light, You're checking different angles from every surface. You're, it's beyond white glove testing. And this is why handmade coach built products still command an extremely high price because you, you're told that these people should be analyzing your product with that level of detail. And that's why when a Bugatti has like a row of 10 missed stitches and a, an area that's unpainted, you're like, wait a minute. I'm not getting what I paid for. What I paid for was that analysis mm -hmm. and that perfection. And, and that's when the brand takes precedence over the process yep. and everybody loses. Okay, but back to the, the value state, mm -hmm. what you want is a optically perfect set of coatings, for example. Mm -hmm. Well, Tesla AI can analyze that car at a higher level of precision, measuring individual photon, photons of light and their wavelength per refraction in less than a second. That's why you can make these changes so fast, because in less than a second, I mean, you have to paint the car, which takes a certain amount of time, but the analysis is now effectively instant. And you know, on one vehicle, did you improve or degrade the situation? And you can consistently experiment. The reason why most companies withhold change for a long time is because the recertification quality insurance process takes months. You shut the whole process down over a holiday break and you have a different team some experts come in and they say no routine employees you don't get to fiddle with this you don't get to touch this so now you create classism again and disenfranchise people so unions try to fight back from that and it ends up slowing down the system more one of the reasons tesla continues to not have people outcry we want unions is one people like to work there and two the benefits of a union don't outweigh the penalties. You can have Tesla stock, which is worth a lot of money <laughs> and its volatility is useful to you. You can trade on the volatility. So you actually, you like that. It's, it's not necessarily a bad thing when it has a bad week, month or year. Yeah, you can you can jump on the stock and uh, refill like I, like I say, <laughs> always refill. Yeah. To, to close that thought, the, the digital self-management stacks, the Tesla AI implementation, are specific to reducing a weight state. 
So if I would need to say, I need to wait to know, is this paint shape being correctly painted? That's a reason to invest in the algorithms and training them. So you, that question's answered immediately. Um, if you have a question about, um, am I getting the lowest cost respectfully, ethically available from my suppliers? That's where permutations of auto bidder are super useful to you to help understand supply chain navigation. So you're not waiting on, is this supplier ethically approved? Can I engage with them? You can do it right now because you have these tools that help answer these questions immediately. Contract analysis, et cetera. These are Tesla AI pieces. And behind that, you can say, what we're trying to do is execute queuing theory well. We're trying to eliminate queues, which has very well understood math and science as it's good, right? And it also motivates people. Something magical happens when humans can go from idea to done in less than about 30 days. Our ability to perceive the entire flow is different. And that gets orders of magnitude better the shorter it gets. And when you can get to less than three hours, your, uh, your depth of understanding of an entire system is bizarrely higher than someone who's been working on 12 different projects over the last seven years. And one of them has gone live. Wow. Yeah, that's it. I, I'm just astonished what you say, because maybe that's the machine Elon was talking about when he said uh, the machine that builds the machine isn't the company like everybody thought. Uh, maybe it's the AI system that's behind that, because um, those decisions to, to decide that fast and, and to give you context based information that is uh, important to you right now and at that place and that point of the line. And now we are seeing at Giga Texas that they have an agile line even which can change because they, they don't have a real line anymore. It's more like little drones that, that drive around the the thing that makes it even more agile because then if you if you have to change something. It can be changed in an instant. And also with the processes, with the big gigacasting machines that just eliminates like 300 robots uh, with one press. <laughs> It's really crazy what's what's happening there. And um, I'm thinking about because Germany isn't as, um, how would you say, uh, as software focused or not as good in software, I would say. Uh, it's depend. It's like, it's a bold statement. But, but what I mean is that If I see the board computers from the German car manufacturers and I compare it, I'm, I'm seeing BlackBerry versus Apple right there. And it scares me a little bit because they are so focused on their buttons. And I have a little anecdote that um, maybe helps to elaborate this point. I won't name any names because it's uh, more or less confidential. This information was told me by a friend. Um, he's working for a very big design firm in Germany, very large in the top 10 <laughs> more I want to elaborate, but they um, redesigned some some things for a car brand and they went straight to fluid design, uh, animations, mobile first, really a state of the art design that is important today. And yeah, then they started to talk with the interface designers <laughs> from the board computers. And that was a huge discussion because uh, talking about silo thinking, uh, Prime example of that. Um, so they had really problems. They said, please do flat design. Why don't we change that a little bit more like that? No, it has to fit the design of the car. Okay, 3D buttons. Okay, you need 3D buttons because people don't know what, what a digital button is looking like. Uh, that gives me like really BlackBerry vibes from 2005 or something. <laughs> And uh, when I look at the interface as, as a designer, I don't really care about all these buttons. I mean, like... Per definition, the designer more or less is most of the time a minimalist, more or less, uh, you could say that. Uh, it, it depends on what background you have. But this is really what, what really um, shows to me and how, how they structure um, software. And the problem was also that Germany, which is a very um, restrictive country in some ways um, with, with, um, with this because they want to regulate everything very fast. So many startups in the 90s just went straight to, to America And said, okay, you know what, I, have, I want to go to a market that is more open and I, I can't have that regulation here. And, and because they wanted to test things and America allows you that by default, just do your thing. We will eventually come and ask you to pay your 
fair share more or less but but we let you lose and you can even you don't even have to have earnings for a long time and in germany it is not like that you have to have profits eventually because they want to have taxes it's very important for them you can grow but not as fast you can not grow as fast like in the us so the markets are very different um but so so it's not the company's fault all the time it's also the regulation um uh, in germany that's special and you have to improve everything and and so on so we know that from the giga factory in germany which took like two years which is crazy for sure <laughs> it's so crazy fast and i was so uh, that's why i started the channel because i saw that every american uh tesla specialist uh, or tesla youtuber couldn't wrap their head around why does it take so long <laughs> and i'm sitting in germany and like this is so fast you guys <laughs> have no idea how fast this is for germany and um yeah but but my point is that software development uh is is not as good here than it is in the US, I think. And um, we have a lot of problems because the German automotive company really companies really outsource everything to different uh, companies. And that's why, yeah. Well, more and more bringing it in-house. But y yeah, then that's they try. where this agile thing comes from. Because if you bring software development in-house and apply a, a five-year development cycle to it, I, the pace of innovation still doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, whether it was in house or out of house wasn't the problem. It was where is innovation faster, and <laughs> so there's a still a process opportunity. Yeah, yeah. But, like, many people don't seem to understand yet that Musk is not all about vertical integration. Hmm. Ver vertical integration is a result of mm. using physics as the limiter of pace of innovation, and if the suppliers are not motivated to if they're not near the limit of pace of innovation then musk can't use them i get um, it no, it's yeah. simply that uh, there's a great example of one of the fuel pumps for an early version of the spacex rockets what's now eventually become raptor engine and musk wanted to buy that part because it's essentially an internal combustion engine. It's basically an F1 engine is, is basically what it is. And its job is to throw combustibles into the actual rocket engine, which Musk was already saying we have to make. Well, this is, is it's not a commodity, but it, it's not the deep knowledge that Musk wanted to invest in. Yeah. It, it, yeah. It's almost an internal combustion engine and it sits on the side of the rocket. So it's rocket engine. Musk wanted to buy those. No one in the in the supply chain for these could engage in less than three years. And the prices were all in the tens of millions. And I, whether it's euro or US dollars, luckily they're near enough that when we're talking tens of millions, it, it's a rounding error between the two almost. So Musk had to bring that in-house. That was never the intention. And be, because the iteration length was way too long and the cost was just abusive and and that's a symptom of how in how inefficient the organization is with capital allocation so musk would love efficient highly motivated uh, highly innovative suppliers <laughs> but musk kept saying look would someone get into tunneling now musk is saying people would you get into lithium mining and nickel well, well, guess what Musk is going to have to do next? Mm -hmm. Because the, the, the existing, the incumbents are not stepping up. Yeah, that's crazy because right there, then there you also see the, uh, the culture unfolding right before our eyes. Because in Tesla, like Fazad also talked about that, that you, you have to remove bottlenecks in the company. That's the most important thing. And if you're trying to like game the system and do politics inside of the company and try to get ahead, because you try to manipulate people, then you're out eventually. Uh, people will recognize that and say, wait a second, that's not efficient what you do. That's not removing bottlenecks. That's not uh, complying with our mission. What the hell are you doing? You get three strikes, you're out. And that's very interesting because then he says, oh, the bottleneck is lithium mining. Hello, can somebody supply us this much lithium? Are you on the edge of, of, of that? No? Okay, uh, damn. Okay, got to start a mining company now. So he eliminates the limiting factors 
all around uh, that. Okay, and that's how 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 it's done. Yeah, that's that's pretty uh, obvious now. Like when when you think about it, the goal is not vertical integration. It's it's that's how unmotivated most of business is. How how uncompetitive yeah. most of business is. Why should you uh, invest? in anything and throw out a huge amount of dollar and R&D and everything that you have to do to build a process or, or product to, to help you with your business. If it's cheaper to outsource it, then do it. But but that's something I didn't know also. That's very interesting. And then to come back to the German uh, thing that we have a lot of small and medium enterprises here in Germany that are really really good, like um, hidden champions, like we call them. Yeah, if they want to supply Tesla one day, and I mean, Groman Automation, for example, that was bought by Tesla, is a German company. That's a huge factor for the battery line right now. Groman produces those machines that um, pass around the batteries very fast. And not only that, but th this was huge. And this was so overlooked in the media also. I was like, uh, hello, that's a really good robotics company it's just a small german company yeah we have a lot of <laughs> those small german companies who are very highly specialized and highly competitive i mean even bosch bosch is very huge a supplier of, of parts they could build an ev like it's no problem for them to build an ev but they're just suppliers but uh, we have a lot of companies i mean bosch is not small but uh, you you get the point and this is something also that's very interesting like the point that you said if they don't want to vertical integrate we have a lot of companies to work with here uh, so if the process is flu uh, fluid and agile they can really work together there and that's very interesting and yeah so because i was talking with alex voigt about that topic i said oh what, what will be happening with all the small and medium enterprises in germany if vw uh, goes bankrupt or something like that i was just um, fantasizing i know vw is a big player. He, I don't think that they will fail, but never say never. And I don't want that e uh, either to happen. So uh, no, I don't want that. Uh, but I was asking then well, what's happening with the SMEs. And he said, well, they, Tesla will handpick their SMEs and there will be uh, especially the hidden champions and just uh, work with them with, if, they, if they need to. Yeah. Now, now, this I think is a massive opportunity that is not I'm not seeing it addressed anywhere yet. Mm -hmm. um, and that is, what do you do if you're not working for a Musk company? Really? I mean, in, in a way, Tesla being publicly traded, which was almost not true. And if the Saudi fund had been honest, it, it, it would have been taken private years ago. But they tried to play that against Tesla to drive the share value down and ended up investing in Lucid, which anyway, that, that's the whole thing. The world is not fair, unfortunately. Like the, the laws of physics aren't fair. They're just the laws of physics and you can do all kinds of stuff. So it's up to humans to create and maintain the concept of fairness. And what the Saudi found did was not fair. And weirdly, the SEC ruled in favor of the not fair play. That was very strange. There was a lot of financial benefit to people that apparently control the SEC. And so it's not about fairness currently. That's really too bad. Which, by the way, in case people don't know, like in a, a few weeks or months, this will be obvious. The acquisition of Twitter is 5D chess. It's to force the same SEC scrutiny that was applied to Tesla and bring that to the top courts. I mean, that's what it is. That, that is exactly what is happening. The, the cool thing is it's now May 19th and you'll be like, Joe Justice is a genius. <laughs> But it, this is clearly what's happening. Mark this part in the video. Yeah, everybody, write that down. <laughs> I mean, Musk said as much in Twitter, but people don't take what Musk says at face value. He's like, you should get into lithium mining. You'll make a lot of money. People are like, nah. Like it's just... <laughs> so anyway, um, what do you do if you're not working in a Musk company? Because these companies currently win so hard and so much better that it, it, it's like, what do you do if you still want to work at BlackBerry? There is still BlackBerry and for network devices, they're, they're actually highly competitive. So there's some other niches BlackBerry has found. But what do you do if you're really the expert in flip phone hinges? Like, man, there's an opportunity. Or for the transmission, the, the thing you have to kick with your feet. I don't know what is it called. Oh, it's like a clutch pedal? The clutch pedal, yeah. There's also a friend of mine works at a company that 
produces those clutch pedals and they have software also because ele- acceleration and, and and things like that with with electro motors also but they, they are transitioning slowly but clutch specialists for example yeah go on please i don't want to interrupt of course, people who made whips for horses <laughs> right that's a smaller industry now than it once was so what do you do because you could say all right i see the future And at least in the near term, it's uh, Musk has a phenomenal track record. It's a good bet to get inside that ecosystem. And even with the amazing rate of hiring and appetite of hiring in Giga Shanghai, in Giga Texas, in Giga Bradenburg, uh, and more to come, uh, many people skip uh, the Netherlands and New York in the United States, but they also have very sizable Tesla installations. And then all of SpaceX, Neuralink, Boring Company, OpenAI, et cetera, oh, Twitter soon. Um, they still can't employ all 7.x billion humans alive. So what do you do? And this is part of the future planning that's important for humanity. Because if the culture that expands out among the stars is only the people, this, this goes back to the burnout part you talked about is only the people that are that mission focused and driven and 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 can perform and get hired in and perform in a must company if those are the people that go out to every other galaxy like how can i say what's the good story for people who really want to work four hours a week or four hours a day or even only eight hours a day and then become really good at playing the piano What's the winning story for people who really want to be involved in engaged parents? What's the winning story for people who really want to do anything other than the current Musk companies because they're so dramatically successful? Now, Tesla stock has enabled some people to be successful as the Musk companies are successful without working in the companies. That, I think, was a really clever move sociologically. But what else? How else do you add value? And here's part of the problem. The Tesla companies, uh, sorry, the Musk companies do not publish known stable interfaces to invite others to play along. Now, I don't think they don't want to. It's not prioritized. So when the supercharger network opened up to allow other manufacturers to charge. And that continues to ramp up right now. Many more countries just went online with other mm-hmm. Germany was one of the first there. ones, yeah. Mm-hmm. As it should be. Mm-hmm. It wasn't, here's our standard adapter. We're going to make it available for free. In fact, we'll even pay you a stipend if you put it on your chargers. If, if someone wanted to own a supercharger franchise and without working in the Musk company, open up your superchargers in front of your restaurant, You don't get to do that. There's not a way to profit without hard work in the Musk ecosystem, except for buying stock. And in a way that's beautiful, and it avoids freeloaders and free riders, in a way that's super tragic. What if your real passion is getting better and better at the piano? You're not pro, you're not going to make money with it, but you love the piano. How do you contribute to this cool future? How do you get yourself a ride on the rockets out to your own galaxy where you want people who are also passionate about playing the piano. How do you do that? What's the winning situation? And I think Charlie, I'm trying to remember Charlie's last name, who was interviewed by Farzad on Farzad's channel, Farzad Mm Mosbazi. Charlie is a software engineer, was a software engineer inside Tesla's Fremont facility where I worked as well in, in California in the United States. And two very interesting pieces jump out of that interview. And I recommend everybody watch it. If you're not already following Farzad Mesbazi and Tesla Fix, please do so. I'm going to link it in the video right now on the information corner right here. And you can watch it after this episode, please. Thank you. (laughs) Wait till this episode is done and all the ads have played and you've bought things from them. Uh, No ads rolling on my channel. It's too small. (laughs) But that's good for the people. Yeah. Charlie says, one, Charlie was a software developer inside the factory. And I don't think most people get Mm, that. People mm -hmm. are like, software development happens in an office, blah, blah, blah. No, Charlie was on a metal catwalk, suspended above machines, programming stuff that affects those people and those machines. 
and the things those machines are building. Like your goal, even when writing software, is to be within touching distance of the production that's most closely related to even the software you're writing. And I think a lot of people don't get that. So that's one, and that's actually profound. We could have a whole multiple hour conversation just on that. But the second part I wanna take this is what Charlie is doing now that Charlie is independently wealthy. Now that Tesla stock has achieved Charlie's financial independence, Charlie says, I'm gonna paraphrase the best I can. Please watch the actual interview. Mm -hmm. um, there was so much FUD misinformation that even family members were calling Charlie and Farzad in 2018 mm -hmm. saying, it's production hell, your, your stock is worthless, sell it now, like get out while you can, leave the company, even family members who've been so affected by the, the FUD, right? And it was so difficult for Charlie and Farzad to find actual evidence-based financial assessment. They're working in the company, they're working crazy hours, they're pouring themselves mm -hmm. into it and they're saying, is this all a waste of time? I'm actually not mm -hmm. sure. It looks like it has every positive future, but I have all these external attacks. Is this, is this a waste of time? Should I escape? Charlie now addresses that basically for fun because he achieved financial independence. And his company is around understanding the fundamentals of whatever investment is passionate to you, simply making that more transparent. And this is part of how people outside Tesla can, you don't have to spend your 12, 14, 20 hours a day passionately furthering a certain set of missions. You can have your own life and still at least have some rational decision makings on investments. Charlie mm -hmm. is solving that. What I'm attempting to solve is what are the degrees of business structure from Musk mm -hmm. to now that you understand the range to even more intense and then less so you can find what fits what's useful to you for your own company. Now to engage in that, you need to be in a position to help shape the structure of the company and not everyone's in that niche, but that's the piece I'm attempting to bring to the world now that I'm outside Tesla. So mm -hmm. you have these Musk graduates Musketeers. who I think are chipping <laughs> away at the problem mm -hmm. of what do you do if you're not actively working in a Musk company? And part of it comes because we've worked in Musk companies and the rest of the world is like at 0.25 speed on an audiobook. <laughs> and you're like, what do I do? What do I do now? It's so <laughs> Everything's slow. coming so slowly. <laughs> I have all this time. What do I do? Oh God, this cracks me up. Yeah. <laughs> Now I get it. Yeah, that's pretty interesting. Um, is it also because if you work for a company like that, you observe that and then your brain is so primed on the remove bottlenecks, uh, realizing that we live in a bigger system, like not political system, but system system of, of yeah, nations even and also a perspective from the world, because we live in a global world. We live maybe one time in a world where we are multi-planetary. And I mean, it's far-fetched, far but it's never been so close like now. Uh, you could say that at least. It's interesting to see that perspective. Was it like that, that, that this perspective change was induced by, the, by, by working at Tesla? Well, this isn't the first time in the history of humanity that this has happened. But this is the first time in this current set of humans on planet Earth's lifetime that this has happened, or, or right at the end of the overlap. The last time appears to have been the Second Great War, mm -hmm. when it was unfortunately even more nationally divided and mostly yeah. about trying to change revenue streams to make different families rich. I mean, it's just truly ethically gross. Um, but... What did happen is if you look at the pace of innovation of the things that were funded at the time, unfortunately, largely weapons of war, but some logistics for food and that kind of thing, you had a Cambrian explosion of innovation. You had new aircraft being designed in two days, built, flown, deployed um, all over the world. This definitely wasn't one set of DNA that did this mm -hmm. demonstrably the best, it was fully global, the innovation mm -hmm. explosion. And these people left after 
the war. Now, unfortunately, it was also mm -hmm. a violent experience. So many of them had to cope with that. But the innovation was there. And you had suddenly people land on the moon. Mm -hmm. like, yeah. And I, I, I want to take all the nationalism out of that. It's not like other nations, whatever that even means, weren't too far off pace. But it happened. Like these people knew how to eliminate bottlenecks fast. And strangely, society didn't latch on in a sustainable way. And NASA ended up becoming one of the slowest institutions around. Mm -hmm. uh, so it, it didn't last. Um, and this is part of what X.com mm -hmm. and X as a holding company, part of its larger mission is, is to be the set of machine learning, to be the digital self-management to keep the Musk companies about solving bottlenecks towards a meaningful mission, mm -hmm. even if Musk isn't there. Uh, and when Musk says, I'll stay as CEO or in an important role in Tesla, as long as I'm useful, that's the, the exit. It's not just hiring Herbert Deese, who actually might be awesome at running Tesla, actually maybe, uh, but Deese doesn't have the authority, the current Volkswagen structure. Yeah, totally. Ale Alex touched on that, uh, that I've interviewed, and he really said, like, Volkswagen Group is very uh, structured, like, a structure hell, you could say, <laughs> because... The Porsche and Peach family is is uh, one on one hand, and then you have so many stakeholders in the company. You have the board of the workers who also influence the decisions of of, of the board, and um, yeah, and then you have somebody like Dies who's very like want to be a little bit more Elon Musky, like uh, and and saying the truth, like like saying the the, the failures and problems of VW. But uh, Alex was uh, who is very analyzing the German market uh, said really uh, he isn't as much of a fan of these like everybody else is because he sometimes does the wrong decisions. But also you could you have to say that that. The, the structure of VW is very restrictive in that manner also. So, so it's a double problem at that, that thing. But um, so, so this is a visionary, but, but he can't really grab anything. It's, 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 it's hard, really. It's really hard. But like you said, I also believe that he could be a very good CEO for Tesla also. I am, I'm also on, in that camp. Uh, if Elon Musk wants to retire on Mars one day, maybe, <laughs> or something like that. Well, I think it'd be more that Elon would be handling different bottlenecks. Yeah. I don't think Elon's ever going to stop. No, I, don't, um, I, don't think so. I mean, the, the, the trajectory is to handle what truth means, what media means, what financial services means. Very fundamental also. It's very interesting. So fundamental, yeah. The bottlenecks are the hard problems. Mm -hmm. And what does make Musk superhuman in, I mean, I... I worked with Bill Gates and, and for Bezos and for Musk. And what I believe make Musk, makes Musk different is this durability and willingness to handle the hard problems mm -hmm. forever. Now, I don't know if forever is actually true. Musk could burn out. But the problems Musk chooses to attack even simultaneously are problems none of those other leaders historically approached in a meaningful mm -hmm. way. And Bill Gates' dad attempted to address unequitable taxation, tax escapes on the wealthy in one state and didn't make it. And Musk is attempting to address the concept of truth globally. Mm -hmm. Like there, there's issues of a scale that mm -hmm. these previous very skillful people didn't touch. Mm -hmm. And Musk attacks them. And what, what may happen is is musk may say the digital self-management the rules engines and the feedback loops are durable enough and flexible enough for the growth for the next thousand years mm -hmm. of tesla so i will focus on what is governance mm -hmm. what is currency what is truth and bizarrely musk is actually not a bad person mm -hmm. uh, ethically to be attempting to nudge those issues into a less uh, profiteering domain. Th that's very interesting because I'm observing, I was observing since 2010, the division that's happening all around the world, also in Germany, everywhere. 
uh, like you don't really know, is it Russia who's uh, trying to heat up a discussion with social media, like social engineering, the protests in Arabia, in the yeah. Lebanon and everywhere? Was it uh, controlled by the U.S. government? What, what happened? And stuff like that. And, and we are in an information war, a tug of war everywhere, the, the individuals between. And also in my university, the divisive uh, uh, topics that we discuss, the culture is so different now. I'm thinking about why can't we just like, discuss and respectfully uh, talk to each other also online. It's so crazy. And that's why I resonate so much with Elon Musk, what he's saying. I don't think he's right-wing or left-wing. He's really really cent centered, actually, because... Pretty close, he, pretty he, close. Yeah, pretty close, centered, maybe a little bit more on the right or right now, and maybe in two uh, years it's different <laughs> again, because people change, and people change their minds also. And if you have kids, it's a to totally different story. If you're a young 16-year-old with nothing, you, you say, ah, tax the rich. and but, but when you get older, you realize, hmm, but... I've built something in my life. Uh, why should I be taxed all the time? It's unfair for me or something like that. Or if you have kids, then you have more costs. So you need more money and stuff like that. I view it as Elon Musk is a, in a body, a part that starts to de reconstruct the body inside to improve it. And then you have yeah. an autoimmune reaction to that. And everybody yeah. is attacking because big oil doesn't want <laughs> EVs. They, they tried so hard and, and they have like per day, they had millions of dollars to finance also FUD campaigns. And I'm sure there were FUD campaigns, but um, I have to take my tinfoil hat now off again. But, but you know what I mean? It's like an autoimmune reaction. I, I view it like this. And, and what we see right now, he's just stirring the pot because he sees that there is a problem and he tries to solve that problem also with Twitter. And he realizes, okay, bots, sometimes they are good, sometimes they are not good. And in that case, uh, if, you, if you want to manipulate people into political spectrums all the time and nudge them, like from the design perspective, nudge them all the time into different categories because the algorithm likes categories so he can understand people but people are too complex and that's what we are observing from the usability perspective and from the uh, software development perspective a human is too complex we have to categorize him and all the algorithms they, they benefit that behavior so they like if somebody is very right or very left so so he can target ads to them that's that's the thing and That's also something we have to address and think about. And, and that's why it's good to make an algorithm open source, to look at it and improve it with other people, developers on, on, on GitHub who want to add something. And then it, it's not even an Elon Musk stand anymore. So it's about uh, that. And, and like you said, the data that f flows out of that is also very valuable. It's very like interesting times we live in. <laughs> it's very crazy, yeah. Young, your design skill is a phenomenal angle in a conversation on these topics. I'm really grateful for it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah, influencing people and nudging people is very, uh, like, it can be so beneficial. It can be so good. Like, if you prime people to work on one thing as a collective, which is very complicated to do, if you think about it. I mean, 110,000 workers. How do you coordinate that? That's why AI is so important. But like Elon Musk said, it also can be misused. You can use it for something bad or something good. Uh, social media can be good or bad. It, it, it depends on the view and how you use the tool. It's just a tool. And humans can use a wrench to build something or a wrench to fight against each other. It's, it's, it's possible. So, so that's very important to, to see that. But um, I, I wanted to end our interview with one uh, question um, because now we like went a little bit away and fetched far but now we can come back and, and think about what do you think can German auto especially do um, to keep up or, or because that's your topic also like helping different companies uh, improving and and be more agile and get a little bit more of this Tesla DNA and implement that. What is your take on that? Do you see a position maybe in the company? Does it have to change something or, or how do you see it? The, the pace of innovation is the only thing that matters in the long run, mm -hmm. period. So if we accept that, uh, if we take that as an axiom, if we accept that as an axiom, pace of innovation is the only thing that matters in the long run, then the necessary steps for current German auto Well, actually, Tesla is current German auto, but uh, non-Tesla, current German auto, is very clear. The concept of a model cycle 
being seven years, maybe five years on a high refresh model. Mm -hmm. And the concept of a minor model change approximately every two and a half years, that concept is broken, but at least we can start by shortening it. Mm -hmm. What would it mean to have a minor model change once a month? Actually learning to execute that, whereas even the idea of a cadence is flawed and won't win. Mm -hmm. But learning to execute that will cause so many bottlenecks to be addressed that aren't being addressed now. So many difficult conversations to be had. Yeah. <clears throat> so many difficult engineering feats to happen. Uh, so many difficult supplier integrations to occur that these companies will learn how to win if they choose to. So say, can we do a minor model change once a month? Can we do a major model change every six months? And again, that pace is non-competitive. Te Tesla is doing 60 part changes a day. Mm -hmm. and 61 or more part deletions a day. I mean, that's the benchmark. You've got to beat that. You've got to get to a thousand new parts today and a thousand and one parts deletes, deletes a day. I, that, I, that's what you'd have to do. You'd have to be an order of magnitude better for the customer to experience it. And, but how do you get towards that? Let's collapse the current rhythm before we delete the current rhythm. And uh, what Ford in the USA is trying now has some very good precedent. Mm -hmm. They're starting a new company, oh, Ford great. E. Mm -hmm. Now, the how that company is actually being started is not exactly what I would recommend. It's not agile and nimble enough in my assessment. Mm -hmm. But the concept of saying, let's create a new company with new employees hired in. So we reset the clock, reset the expectation. We have a chance to reboot the culture is probably not a bad idea. Uh, in, in fact, there's great precedent of that. GE had uh, some temporary but excellent successes with GE Fastworks. Toyota uh, is experimenting now mm -hmm. with Woven Planet in Tokyo as a wholly owned but entirely separate uh, company. I have to point out Polestar there because they really made a good electric vehicle. You could say that also the Polestar is really also very good. Well, mm -hmm. to your point... Um, Bosch could make an electric e electric car. They don't. But it's not about making it. It's about how fast does it continuously improve. Mm -hmm. That is it. Not who made a good electric car once mm -hmm. upon a time. Yeah. It's piece of innovation is the only thing that matters in the long run. So the Joe Justice's advice <laughs> to non-Tesla German and global manufacturing would be the only game in town is shorten your new product introduction cycles as hard as that is mm -hmm. and attempt to increase the amount of value delivered to the customer per innovation cycle that will disrupt all of your income models all of them well service profits on serviceability so they want to train their service staff once every seven years on the major model yes it will disrupt all of that this will not be trivial easy unions will be angry about budget reallocation. The people that were building internal combustion engines will be angry unless you immediately give them a nicer job packing battery packs, which mm -hmm. should be robotic anyway. Mm -hmm. But that is it. Pace of innovation is the only thing that matters in the wrong one, long run. The first step towards that, which is not the winning step, it's not the end game, but the first step towards that is shortening the existing cycles. And that's also where where uh, Scrum could help, or systems like Scrum. I mean, in manufacturing, they have maybe different uh, like tools they use or, or different workflows, like there are hundred millions of workflows you can use. But That is exactly yeah. what Scrum is good at doing, mm -hmm. is taking a year or longer development cycle and collapsing it into mm -hmm. a 30-day or shorter development cycle. And then, of course, you discard it once you pass that point. Mm -hmm. um, worse yet, though, most of the companies we're talking about have Scrum with year-longer budgets. It, 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 didn't, it didn't happen. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it, yeah. <laughs> is it no, to achieve the thing that could be achieved yet? If you actually do all 11 parts of Scrum, it's actually very good at that, forcing you to a 30-day or less budgeting cycle and product mm -hmm. release cycle which that is the next step for all these companies. Yes, that would still be non-competitive with Tesla, but learning that will put you on the trend to be relevant, competitive, maybe even surpass what the Musk companies are already achieving.
That's very interesting. Uh, at that point, I highly recommend uh, Joe's book also because uh, I I didn't read it, but but I read a little bit of the introduction and everything. I but I assume it it will be good. I'm honest here, but <laughs> but I, I appreciate I your honesty. It, I recommend you looking into that uh, at least at least uh, Google it, <laughs> and and yeah, I'm I'm sure there are um, really hot takes also inside it there. Um, for that topic. But for the end, I, I want, just want to add one thing is that German auto can really learn from Tesla and see what's happening in Brandenburg because there will be bottlenecks with the water supply, for example, is a huge topic here. Uh, the environmental groups that are always suing against everything and... From Stuttgart, interestingly. Yeah. Environmental groups in Stuttgart. What, what, wait, what? <laughs> yeah, it, in Germany, it's so really a really complicated thing with the environmental groups because it's sometimes used to stifle innovation, almost, you could say, because it's an electric vehicle company and, uh, okay... Um, That's something very important, an important mission. The mission from Tesla is really focused on changing the environment to a better place or the earth to a better place. It's not about like mining everything and uh, pulling stuff out of the soil. And no, they want to improve that also. That is uh, feasible for the environment also. So, so they're really trying. And yeah, sometimes it's used as a strategy because not many companies, some companies don't like Tesla here, I can imagine, because they are on, on their home turf. And that's also an autoimmune reaction, I would say. But yeah, maybe we can learn something from Tesla there. And maybe we have to just to observe what's happening. Um, how will they get rid of those bottlenecks? How can they help maybe also the government a little bit? Like, like oh, your process, I would recommend doing it like this. Or you could add that. And may maybe it, it, the German old structure starts to move a little bit more um, because it's shaken right now. And that's, that's a good thing, I think. There's a real opportunity for planet Earth and, and soon beyond to figure out how can structures such as companies, such as governments, amplify yeah. each other the type help, of innovation help each that's other. happening. And, and Musk has proposed some, some action plans, like sunsetting laws um, that are no longer relevant or having a maximum lifespan for a law before rewrite, that type of thing, Re retiring laws, reducing the total yeah. law load, mm -hmm. um, simplifying tax code, et cetera, making making doing business more walk up simple to reduce the burden, the bottlenecks of doing business. Um, those are meaningful activities. Mm -hmm. But essentially, imagine if 1% of GDP, and, and then get crazy, imagine 80% of GDP, uh, global domestic product, not gross domestic product, global planetary product, mm -hmm. GP, D. <laughs> 1% of the financial transactions on planet Earth's value were taxed, were funneled to direct innovation. And so I'll say who currently is, has a higher financial efficiency innovation. Currently it's the Musk companies, but it doesn't have to be Musk, but say for now it is. Imagine if instead of having to defend themselves from the world's ecosystems, the world ecosystems were trying to clear debris out of the road ahead of the Musk companies and funding them. Think what would be possible in the next 30 years If even 1% of one country, as arbitrary and weird as the country is, tax base went instead of that sliver of defense or whatnot, but just was given to Musk, given directly to Musk. What I do is 20% of whatever my income is a year, I spend on Musk company products and services, like a, like a tithing, like a, a social service. And the upside mm -hmm. is it ups my investments. I make more than 20% mm -hmm. on average the years. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't lose, I actually make, and I get these awesome products and services mm -hmm. like Starlink and my Tesla. And it, it's totally cool. I'm saving up now to buy out a launch on Starship to prototype space houses. Mm. That's, you may have heard about that from other. Yeah. I, uh, I've heard about that. Uh, I, I wasn't sure what it's about. <laughs> I was a little bit confused, but, but interesting stuff. Yeah. So that, What can we do as a business that reduces a future bottleneck for the Musk companies or even directly services mm -hmm. them? Can your company lease or buy Teslas? 
can your company use Starlink for business instead? Mm -hmm. What can you do that amplifies this ecosystem? If you like innovation, mm -hmm. you would want to participate in the most innovative player to further them. I already did in 2020 when I started to watch Stephen Mark Ryan's videos about investing. I believe Farzad and his colleagues also started to watch those financial YouTubers one day and realized, oh, God, uh, the FUD is like helping them to cope with all the stress from outside. It, it, that's also like a huge, huge topic. We could talk like hours about how the Tesla community really helped the workers to stay on track uh, because they have fans like they're cheering on the sideline. Yeah, you're doing a great job. Do it more. And we love the company and stuff like that. And that's very motivating for them. A huge uh, underlooked factor like They don't need uh, commercials because the other automotive companies pay for the commercials for them because people will Google electric uh, vehicles and realize, oh, uh, Tesla Model Y seems really interesting. And uh, ad spending is like zero besides from the nice festivals we were seeing <laughs> observing from Giga Texas. Um, also, uh, I, I had student loan debt and 2020 Tesla helped me get out of this debt. So... That's something very good. And I realized the more I've looked into the company and the most Germans I talk to in the automotive industry can't wrap their head around the company and don't realize it's not an automotive company. Not only that, it's the system, it's the culture, it's the it's the artificial intelligence. That's what we've learned today from Joe Justice here. And it's so important to to look at that and, and see it's not about cars it's not about robots it's not about solar energy not only that it's it's about more than that it's about a system that helps to create value for people that we can live on earth the happiest that we could maybe we can play a piano for example or learn something else because we have more time allocations to something else because um Value is created by robots or by automation or by a smart contract, for example, in the government even. Yeah, stuff like that. It's very interesting times. And I'm very grateful to have somebody like Joe Justice who really understands topics like that. And that's why I'm very thankful to have you on the podcast. Great interview. I really liked it very much. Maybe you want to tell the audience something that's new, what you are working on or something like that. Jan and anyone on the internet, when we have a chance, let's meet for a great coffee or a wonderful beer depending on time of day. Um, my book is called Scrum Master. It's available on Amazon and LeanPub. You can reach my courses or consulting that I use to fund the Starship launch to help prototype spacefaring homes at www.abi-agile.com. That's Agile Business Institute-agile.com. I'm on Twitter. I have currently have a 100% reply rate. Uh, so if you had a question or comment, agree or disagree, you can tag Tesla Fix and tag at Joe Justice. And currently I respond to all of them. So that'd be an easy way to reach me. Jan, you are awesome to talk to. What a luxury to enjoy this conversation. Let's absolutely have a coffee or beer together, maybe with a few people who watch the show sometime when we have a chance to be yeah. physically located or even a remote coffee or beer if we have to. <laughs> yeah, that's a good idea. If you ever visiting Switzerland or Germany, please hit me up. You can crash on my couch or something. No problem. Uh, everything fine. Um, we have space here where I live. We should keep in touch. Uh, I really enjoyed the conversation and I was, yeah, it was awesome to, to listen to your takes on, on that topics like agility and everything. Thank you very much to Justice. For everybody else, go check his links out that I've put into the description. And thank you, Joe Justice, for this great interview. And there's only one thing to say now. Goodbye. Aloha.